Welcome to the Petrum podcast. I'm Julie Bills. I am the product marketing manager at Petrum. And this is our inaugural kickoff of the Castle series. And our guest today, our featured guest is Sharong Ho. He's the CTO of Petrum, as well as a couple other prestigious positions that he's going to tell us a little bit more about. And I'm joined as always with my colleague, Adil Islam, who is our lead product manager. So we'll get into this a little bit. Trong, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where, where are you right now? Great question, Julie. So, so I, as you've introduced me, I'm the CTO at Petrum, but also it's a co-founder. And I also have a close connection with today's topic, which is the Castle open source ecosystem. Uh, I serve as a member of its technical committee, uh, as well as its organizing committee for some of the events that we have planned uh, later this year. So in some sense, I lead a dual role with my role as CTO role as Petrum, but also my broader open source role, the Castle organization. Uh, and I'm also a faculty at the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence in the UAE. So all these roles, I think, come together to... I think allow me to best serve the ML ops community as well as the wider AI community in terms of providing the pieces of technology that then go into the uh, systematic and principal construction and building of AI applications that will actually be, I think, robust and reliable enough, but also powerful and performant enough to serve in real world applications. So that's just kind of a little overview of the different roles that I, and different hats that I play right now. Uh, did I answer your question, Julie? Yeah, that's very good. Very, very good introduction. Very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, so are you, are you in the UAE right now? In fact, I spend part of my time in the United States and part of my time in the UAE. So today I'm actually sitting in the Petrum, Petrum Pittsburgh office, oh, right? Nice. Uh, you know, as an, as a company, right? Petrum, we have, uh, you know, offices in both Sunnyvale in California and Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And of course, you know, our employees are distributed across the United States. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been, you know, pretty surreal to think about how uh, when we started as a startup, we were this tiny thing in Pittsburgh. But then uh, as we expanded kind of in a way across the country, we have everyone from the Petrum family all over, you know, all over the country. And then, you know, soon in a couple of weeks, I'll be dialing into some of these meetings from, you know, my, my office in the UAE. So okay. again, maybe this is a product of our times, but it's surreal to think that we can be uh, in touch from wherever we are in the world these days. Yeah. Okay, so maybe tell us then, since you are a founder of Petrum and you started as a small company in Pittsburgh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the founding story. Indeed. So uh, I think the story goes back to uh, my time as a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University, where uh, the research that I did uh, on a field that we call machine learning systems Right? So these are pieces of software that allow us to tackle some of the uh, scalability and productionization challenges in taking uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence applications out from the laboratory or research environment and into production, uh, whether that's at a massive tech company or it's at a startup that's trying to build uh, you know, a game-changing AI application for the first time. So the Petrum story uh, really starts back in 2012, as I mentioned, uh, where some of the research that myself and my colleagues at, uh, well, in this case, colleagues being fellow graduate students, and of course, some of the faculty like my advisor, Eric Singh, right? We did research on scaling up machine learning models. Uh, and these were the days just before deep learning took off. So the, the popular models of those times uh, were a little different from what we used, we are used to today. Uh, but the principles are the same, that some of these uh, machine learning programs uh, will either not run to completion in a satisfactory amount of time on a single laptop or desktop, or they are so big that you can't actually fit them into the memory of one of these boxes. And so either way, you have an incentive to scale up in terms of the number of machines that you put to this machine learning program. 
And then the technology is really, how do I ensure that the program, these machine learning programs are a little different from our, uh, maybe the traditional view of computer science, where you have tasks and then you can divide and conquer them in a certain way, and you can split them across the machines. If you can kind of just do the analysis of the program and put them on different machines, you'll have your parallel program. But machine learning programs are a little bit different because they're, they've been variously described as optimization programs or search programs across a large space. And so there are interesting tricks you can do when it comes to taking a search problem and dividing it in a way such that many you know, machines working together as a team can solve this problem faster than you would if you had just divided the work in a uh, kind of straightforward what I'm calling divide and conquer, chop up the problem and give everyone a piece kind of uh, uh, way of doing things. Now that technology back then, we created an open source project that was called Petrum, right? Which is the company, our company name today. And that open source project became the genesis of Petrum, the startup that we were in stealth mode from 2014, right? So timeline here is 2012 to 2014. We're developing this technology 24 into 2016 is when we are in stealth mode. And 2016 is when we raised our first uh, round of capital. Okay. And then, so how did Petrum become Castle, right? Or, well, the Petrum open source project. Now, Petrum is now associated with the name of the company, but the open source uh, 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 project that we are backing called Castle is actually the second generation, in my view, of the machine learning systems technologies that were pioneered in the first Petrum open source project. So I kind of alluded to the Petrum open source project having started in the days before deep learning uh, uh, became, uh, I think, the one of maybe the major uh, force driving a lot of AI innovation today. And Essentially, uh, that also was, I think, part of the spirit of the transition from Petrum to Castle in that the AI community basically anchored around uh, this class of machine learning programs called deep learning programs and deep learning models. And they presented a whole new set of interesting challenges for the machine learning systems researchers such as myself, that there were the some of the older ways of splitting up the work in an intelligent fashion to get those parallel computers to work uh, more effectively. Some of them carried over to the deep learning era. Some of those techniques didn't carry over so well, but just as interestingly, uh, the structure of deep learning models exposed another set of technical opportunities and challenges. And that is uh, maybe that's in the nature of you know, software evolution, but it basically spurred us to create a new generation of systems, which are the CASEL project systems we know today. CASEL standing for composable, automatic, and scalable learning, with the composability part is in a way driven by one, the trend that in deep learning, you are creating these models in a hierarchical or compositional fashion, like putting together different units of a model uh, in order to achieve a particular task, whether that may be on image data or video data, whether that may be on audio or text data, right? And in, and, but there's also another element to composability, which is what are the pieces of software that come before the machine learning program and after the machine learning program? So the composability aspect of Castle touches on composability within the deep learning model, and that's captured in our Texar project. But there's also compositionality in a ML pipeline. Like at Petrum, we talk about this concept of universal pipelines, right? Where the ML program is just a piece of a larger puzzle, and you have to piece string together a lot of steps where data is being curated and processed into the form needed by the program. And the output is also being transformed into whatever format is suitable for the task at hand. So that's on the composable side. And now the scalable side is the part that I think shares a lot in common with the Petrum open source project, the first generation. It's really about taking these uh, deep learning programs, which uh, have actually grown to a size and scale that completely dwarfs even the programs of old. You may think that the GPUs and CPUs of today have been growing more powerful, uh, but they haven't grown 
as powerful as quickly as the capacity and size of the data sets that these deep learning models are being trained upon, which then created a new generation of systems, such as our, you know, recently released Alpha project, which allows for, uh, you know, GPT-3 style uh, models, which were previously only the uh, thought to only be the domain of organizations like OpenAI, and you know, making that uh, widely available and accessible for anyone who wants to run or use these things, right? That's what Alpha achieves. And there's also the other uh, scalable technologies like our AdaptDL project that really allows for a set of machine learning programs uh, working together in a production grade cluster to really experience the type of speed up that would only be possible with very careful calibration or tuning of the settings of every program, right? So, so let's break down some of these castle tools so we get a sense of what all is in the ecosystem. So, and maybe we can uh, give our listeners a sense of how the castle tools interact with what we're doing at Petrum and the Petrum platform. Um, so maybe you could give us a couple words about the Petrum platform, uh, or maybe Adel, you know, as lead product manager, you might, you might want to interject some words about the Petrum platform, uh, and then we could kind of break down. Uh, you know, kind of the genesis projects of, you know, like Texar and Adaptio and, you know, the kind of the stuff with a bit more of a history in Castle and then move into some of the newer projects that you just alluded to, like Alpha and Betty. Um, so what can someone, please tell me, what what is the Petrum platform? How would you, how would you describe that? Oh gosh, um, I think Shirong and I would have two different uh, definitions of the platform currently. Cool. Um, but maybe I can give you a quick start, right? Yeah, the do that out. Let's hear. The Petrium platform, as uh, we, we've been developing it, um, you know, based off of all of the history that Shirong just described, is uh, one way to think of it might be the, the ideal vehicle for using all of these innovations that are coming out of Castle. Right? You know, and uh, Shirong started to get into those. I'd love to dive more into them and also the history of all of them because you know some of these uh, technologies like uh, Texar and Forte. Uh, have been around for a little longer, and uh, some of these, like Alpha, recent new kind of groundbreaking. Um, you know, I'd love to go into those. But Petium platform, perhaps you could consider there's the AI operating system part, which you know, as Jirong was mentioning, ML systems becomes ML operations, ML ops, and then then ML ops. There's the infrastructure part of it, and the actual machine learning uh, work of it. And the AIOS part is really about making sure that your Kubernetes infrastructure is going to be manageable and effective and will actually allow for that composability, automation, and scalability for, for teams. And universal pipelines, the other uh, side uh, of it that is uh, more geared towards the standard uh, workflows of a machine learning engineer or even a data scientist is, uh, in fact, it is based off of a lot of these castle technologies kind of put it, coming together in building the machine learning pipeline. A pipeline is the lingo of Know, what a machine learning system should be. And uh, the universality encompasses, again, the principles of composability, automation, and scalability. Um, by the way, uh, you know, I'm curious, Sharon, I'd love to hear your thought on this, but also I'd love to hear your thoughts on why composability, why automation, and why scalability? Why are these the principles that Petium is founded on? And of course, the Castle ecosystem literally embodies in, in name. Yeah. Fantastic discussion, Adil, and I, I think there's two things I'd like to touch on, uh, one being uh, how we see Petrum and its product relate with the Castle open source technologies, and also, you know, what, uh, what, what, why composability, why automation, and why scalability, why did we identify these three needs, and why did we name the entire project around them, right? So maybe I'll, because these questions are actually interrelated, because what Petrum uh, does, as you've alluded to, it serves a set of needs that are not covered under the C or A or S monikers that I've just described, right? It's really serving the needs of uh, infrastructure management in a way that's highly complementary to the Castle uh, uh, projects, because the Castle projects uh, individually, each of the projects uh, is, I think, razor focused on providing a very specific type of value. Uh, we gave some examples about uh, how Texar helps you uh, construct deep learning models in a modular and manageable way, how Forte enables the concept of these universal pipelines that is very suited to a 
the kind of day-to-day -day workflow that a data scientist or say a machine learning engineer uh, would, would kind of experience uh, in their work. Um, however, um, these pieces of software still need perhaps a home to live under. They need ways to speak to each other. They need ways to actually talk to each other because if, if that is not done by a piece of software, then it is the engineers that will have to write that code that allows these programs to talk to each other. So you mentioned, for example, infrastructure management with Kubernetes, which is a, uh, I think an increasingly popular way to manage uh, the, the practice of ML ops at organizations that want Why to is it increasingly popular? If I could just get you to say a couple of words on that too. That's something we've been talking about in the podcast. Why, why Kubernetes? Right. So uh, I think one of the reasons uh, for, for Kubernetes, Kubernetes in the ML space is that uh, many, I think part of that has to do with the rise of containerization and Docker as a way to manage and distribute multiple pieces of a complex software program, such as a machine learning or AI program that has many different pipeline stages. Uh, and may have to interact with other database systems, web servers, and all of these other pieces. If you want to manage all of these uh, properly, it makes a lot of sense to containerize them so that you can portably take them and deploy them on different machines. But if that was all you were doing, you don't need Kubernetes. You can do all that with Docker alone. So Kubernetes comes in because machine learning programs are increasingly uh, require multiple machines to operate. Uh, the first way this shows up is that if you are trying to scale out, scale horizontally the serving capacity of an ML program, the way you would do it is that you would deploy a inference service or API across multiple machines, right? And we see this actually in the way the patch and rampart graphs can be easily copied and redeployed as many times as we need. So you want to be able to scale this out horizontally and have many copies of this inference service so that you can serve as many um, users. You can increase the number of users you serve or the number of customers that you're serving. And now that you're using multiple machines, Docker doesn't provide that functionality. And that's where uh, Kubernetes comes in uh, as a way to manage the deployment of programs that necessarily must run across multiple machines, or maybe it's just programs that need to be duplicated to run across many machines. So these are two of the scenarios. I mentioned horizontal scale, up, but it's also the vertical scale up aspect where you are trying to handle larger and larger models, such as how LPA is able to serve uh, recent open source variations of the massive GPT-3 model that OpenAI uh, uh, you know, pioneered, but now is becoming increasingly uh, democratized in my opinion. The, by scaling up basically means you take an ML program and you make it larger, have a larger capacity, uh, train it on more model parameters, which uh, up to at least a certain extent will improve its uh, behavior, improve its task performance, uh, improve its uh, maybe accessibility to a more general audience that, that can start to see that some of these results are uh, approaching something that would consider Maybe I would not call it intelligent, but at least very interesting from a user's perspective. Like, for example, being able to almost have a conversation with a user in a sort of semi-intelligent fashion. The point is that these things require scale up. And then ML programs that even if they could run on a single machine, they now have to run on four machines. For example, in the Alpha project, we have this online web service uh, hosted by MBZ UAI University, the university where I work at. And this service uses four machines in order to uh, provide the API inference for a GPT-3-like model. So again, you want to be able to do these things on uh, in a managed way, and that's where the technology of Kubernetes comes in. So I only see a growing role for, for Kubernetes going forward because you need to either scale out or you need to scale up. Very cool, thank you. So let's here, I'll just share a screen for a second. Uh, see the best way to not expose everybody to my endless tabs, sorry, lots of tabs. So here, I, I believe this is what you were talking about with Alpa, yeah, that we're hosting the o OPT Alpa. Um, we could start here and talk about this, or maybe it's better, sorry, to do a little overview of 
mm. the castle projects. So you've, you know, we talked about composable, automatic, and scalable. Um, there's there's quite a quite a lot of tools here, um, and you've alluded to some of them, but maybe you could walk us through these. Absolutely. So before I do that, I want to touch on the other question that Adil mentioned, which is uh, why composable, why automatic, and why scalable? What do these three uh, sentences mean, right? So it's said there on the website, but composability is really about the ability to take increasingly complex AI applications. They are getting more complex in that the models are getting larger and more complex, such as GPT-3 but also the pipelines in which they sit in also become more complex, especially as they approach a real world uh, use case. So there is a kind of a, a learning experience that many uh, machine learning graduates in universities go through, where in the university, uh, the entire code lives in one PyTorch file. And then as they get into the real world and start uh, building real AI applications, they see that uh, a real application involves many other pieces of software working together. And so composability is about both the assembly within a single model that's say occurring within your PyTorch environment or your TensorFlow environment, uh, but also the composability between different pieces of software. Uh, now, have I said that in a way that, that makes sense, Julie? Yes, I believe so. So when you talk about composable between different pieces of software, is that where the Petron platform that Adol was describing kind of comes in as a, a platform upon which that composition could? Yeah, and, and to describe that, right, I need to talk a little bit about one of the composable projects, uh, Forte, and its relationship with the Petron platform. So uh, Forte provides, I think, the, the language, a convenient like Python, Python uh, library and language to piece together different parts of an AI pipeline. And then the really cool part between Forte and Petrum is that in the Petrum platform, excuse me, my throat, in the Petrum platform, we have this idea of a universal pipeline translator that takes Forte code and translates that into a universal representation that uh, internally we're calling PIR lib. And I'm mentioning this acronym right now because that is also going to become a castle project. So we're actually planning to open source some of the universal pipeline translation technology that we're pioneering inside Petrum and make that uh, open source to develop our ecosystem uh, further. What does this universe... So Forte basically specifies things that maybe the way a data scientist would think about it in terms of data flowing, data transformation, thinking about operations on data, how they go from pre-processing into training, into inference, into post-processing. Uh, but a universal pipeline is more of a uh, infrastructure or systems representation that starts thinking about the problem in terms of software containers, Docker containers, how they're placed on Kubernetes, right? It's going from the specification that's done by a data scientist or ML engineer and down to the actual operationalization and execution of it in a production environment. So composability actually happens at two layers. And right now in Castle, there's the, uh, well, three layers. If you include composability within ML models, composability at the, at the level of what data is, the journey that data takes from start to model to inference, right? And then also what that translates down to when we get into a cluster of machines and how the Petron platform, uh, with its use of Kubernetes, is able to schedule and manage all of those operations behind a single pane of glass. So a little bit into the details there, but I thought it's important to call out that composability extends from the open source side you know, and deep into what the Petron platform is able to provide with this concept of universal pipelines, universal meaning that they are universally executable anywhere. Yeah, maybe I can add one uh, one more thing ar ar around this while we're you know on the topic of composability and before we move on to automation is that um, there's you know as as Sharon mentioned Forte is open source and uh, Petrium supports it and then we have this kind of um, ecological uh, aspect to the way how Petrium treats its relationship with Castle right? so mm -hmm. Petrium does all of that effort to make. Uh, Forte into something that anyone can use, 
And then we ourselves start to try to use these systems like the data packs within Forte. And by the way, we've had Hector on this podcast before to talk to us a lot more about, about using Forte and told us a bit about the history of Forte as well. And the, the idea that, and now uh, Hector is also the head of engineering here at Petium. Um, so it's a, um, a kind of a beautiful synergy there where we are working on these, on these systems and then we're trying our best to use them in the most effective way. And that applies not just to Forte for universal pipelines, but basically everything that Castle um, has in its, uh, in its toolkit. Yeah, I think you summed it up quite well. Basically, the, the key benefit of Petrum, as I see it, the value that it adds on top of Castle is that it's a, it's a way for multiple Castle technologies to interact with each other. Now, now, to give an example, right, we've been talking about Castle projects and what they do in isolation, but have we thought about how a data pipeline written in Forte, right, is able to make use of scalable technologies like Alpa or DATDL or even our automatic automation technologies such as Tune. And part of this, uh, part of this puzzle, you know, this this of integrating these pieces together uh, is answered by the the dialogue we had just now on the concept of universal pipelines, where we're taking a pipe uh, a pipeline that's expressed in terms of data operations such as Forte and taking it down to an executable level, where we're talking about how containers are managed and scheduled across a cluster, uh, and that's the level that connects to the scalable and automatic technologies because those technologies function on pieces of code that are written for containers. Uh, as an example, what uh, what AdaptDL does under its hood, right? How does it accelerate the training times of many ML programs running at once with uh, basically a hands-free approach, right? It's able to do this without all of the complicated tuning on uh, uh, parameters that machine learning and AI experts would know as batch sizes and learning rates. And these are very difficult to tune for a given AI application, and they also change depending on how large your training data is. Uh, anecdotally, you know, some of the organizations that we work with uh, have told me that they have this table of magic numbers, and depending on the size of their data set, right, they have to use a different number because the, the mathematical properties of these deep learning programs are such that they, uh, uh, the data distribution or even the number of samples will affect some of these other knobs that have to be turned on the model. And AdaptDL is actually taking some of these knobs and turning them automatically. Uh, and it's also able to automatically enlarge the job or shrink it depending on the amount of available resources. Let's say today, the machines are free, then why not use more of them to complete the job faster? But maybe tomorrow, multiple engineers are running you know, a critical set of tests and they need to share the cluster. Then AdaptDL is able to scale those back. And in that scaling up and down, you also have to be turning these knobs. Now, we can only do this if the code is kind of isolated and containerized because the knobs that are being turned in this case are the model training codes, knobs, I mentioned learning rate and batch size are just two examples. Uh, but these are knobs that are not found in the say data pre-processing where we're, for example, creating an ontology in Forte and packing data using the data pack into this ontology, right? The knobs occur at different parts along the pipeline and having the specificity to target a given container and you know, work its magic on that and, and improve the performance or scale up that container to multiple machines or scale that back down to only a few machines. Um, bit of technical liberty there. What you're actually doing is you're increasing the number of resources allocated to the Kubernetes pod that runs the container. But uh, by and large, you can think of it as basically enlarging or shrinking the code that's running the container. Now, that is something that can only be done when you have this concept of universal pipelines and we're talking about the execution infrastructure uh, rather than say the data representation that, that uh, machine learning and engineers and data scientists think about. Because AdaptDL you know, works by talking to systems, computer systems, and, and telling them how to, how to manage this ML job, right? It's a very different uh, uh, way of thinking from what the data scientists and the machine learning engineers are doing with their data pipelines and Forte. Now, I, I hope I've kind of given a bit of sense about how the composable parts 
relate to, for example, the automatic and scaling part in that composability is really speaking the language of machine learning engineers and data scientists. But for automation and scalability to work, it has to speak the language of uh, what of GPUs, of CPUs, of operating systems, of, of Docker containers, of Kubernetes, right? That's kind of the way uh, I, I would describe it to a layperson. That's pretty interesting because we talk a lot about communication issues uh, just on the ML team between data scientists and ML engineers. And we you don't spend a lot of time talking about the communication issues with the actual hardware and the machines themselves. So it's, it's interesting that this is very uh, full stack. That is a very uh, a good word that you mentioned there, Julie. I think one of the reasons why ML ops, the field of ML ops is a complicated subject and, uh, uh, and you know, many startups other than Petrum are all having their different viewpoints on it. But our viewpoint is that there is an entire stack of technologies and some of these technologies require modes of thinking that a data scientist may be more used to or a production or ML engineer may be more used to or even a systems admin that's controlling a Kubernetes cluster might be more used to. Uh, having a piece of software like Petrum that is fluent in all these different languages and able to speak to each user and their needs. And that is backed you know, by this array of castle projects that we're showing that some of them speak to the needs of data scientists and uh, you know, analytics people or machine learning researchers. Some of them speak to the needs of production ML engineers. Some of them even speak to the needs of infrastructure uh, managers. I guess that's more on the Petrum uh, side of things. I think that that is uh, uh, that is one of the key characteristics of the Castle open source system as a whole, and uh, and you know how the Petrum uh, platform plays a role in this ecosystem too. Very cool. Um, okay, so here are the different projects. We touched a little bit on Forte, uh, DAPDL. I don't know if there are any words you want to say about Texar and uh, Tune, maybe, before we get into some of the, the two newest right. projects. So I spoke a little bit about Texar earlier in that it's, uh, it's a way for, if we have data scientists that are basically building the data pipelines that connect to ML programs, there are also the, uh, what, we might sometimes call as uh, AI researchers or, or ML uh, uh, researchers who are responsible for creating and experimenting with different models uh, in order to derive better outcomes for the AI applications. Now, not every um, AI using organization has such people. Uh, it is in fact more typical for uh, uh, AI organizations to consume pre-made models that have been tested and validated in the research community. But if you are a researcher, your bread and butter is experimenting with these models. And Castle, uh, Texa, which is actually one of our more popular projects, is really popular among researchers for its ability to uh, allow them to quickly experiment with the different building blocks of a deep learning model. Right. So again, this is one language that the researchers speak, which is different from the data language that the uh, um, data scientists and data engineers speak. Again, and that's different from what the production engineers speak. Right. So different languages for different people. Now, as for Tune, uh, Tune uh, is part, it falls under the automatic side of the Castle project. And automatic here means that it's responsible for um, accelerating the, the, the tuning knobs of, uh, sorry, I should say accelerating the search for the right tuning, right position of the tuning knobs of different uh, AI and machine learning programs. And uh, what this really means is that inside a typical AI program, and this is something that is the language of AI researchers, uh, you, Models have different configurable parameters. Uh, some of them, like uh, two words I dropped earlier, batch size and learning rate, are uh, so important that uh, that even the scalable projects such as AdaptDL uh, must take control of them in order to uh, uh, give the performance benefits that that it's being advertised to do. But there are also other things such as um, you might be able to shrink or grow the number of model parameters inside a machine learning model. Uh, you may also be able to adjust some of the uh, coefficients or numbers at different layers of the model. And Tune is basically a project that uses a technology known as Bayesian optimization 
to be able to search over any type of parameter you can throw at it. It's something that we call black box, but black box in a good way, black box optimization, uh, in that it's able to take any piece of code and, and still be able to do a hands-free search, hands-free from the perspective of the human that uses the software and find ways to make this ML model either faster or more performant or more economical, right? That's the motivation behind the Tune uh, project. Um, now, maybe as a little bit of a pitch for the, the work that I'm doing uh, personally, um, we are coming up with a new version of Tune. Uh, it's in the works right now that will allow the tuning of not just the machine learning models, but the entire pipeline. We talked about universal pipelines, right? And all the different data processing, pre-processing, post-processing stages. The vision here is to extend Tune to be able to tune all of the knobs in all parts of the AI program. Now, can you imagine how powerful that is going to be? Because the ML model, uh, as we sometimes say, is really only 10 or 20% of the entire pipeline in terms of all the different pieces that you need to put together. So even if we've tuned it, and that does make a big impact on performance, there's still all these other places that we have to carefully manage, and that is taking up valuable time from uh, machine learning teams in trying to the scenario here is that they get a data set uh, and then they they take their model to a different client or different company uh, or different user. And that user has a slightly different data set, right? So they need to kind of specialize the entire AI pipeline, customize it a little bit to that a new, uh, new clients or new organization or new users data. And when they do that, it, you have to touch all of these knobs all over the entire pipeline all over again. And that is something that it's a need that has emerged because of the practice of ML ops, right? Uh, if we were talking about a research setting where people are only uh, are focused, laser focused on the model itself, then there's no awareness that there are tuning knobs outside of the model. But these knobs exist for one concrete example being inside a machine translation pipeline. There are actually several different ways you can take the raw data and perform what, uh, now, this is a word that Hector might use, right? Our dear colleague Hector Fetchum performed the splitting of the data into different unit words. It's, it's a process that the NLP, natural language processing people, call tokenization. There's more than one way to do this. Or take another example. Go back to that. This is a great time to show that alpha uh, page again. Julie, if you take the alpha page, and I'll scroll down a little bit. Scroll down until I tell you. See those parameters there, response length, temperature, and top P? These are knobs that are unique to uh, the way GPT-3-like models work when they generate the response to your query. So obviously response length tells you how many words I'm allowed to generate from it, but temperature and top P also affect in some sense the qualitative landscape of responses you will get. These are parameters that don't exist when you train the model. They're parameters that only happen when you do inference on this model. So what I'm pointing out here is that there are so many places where there are tuning knobs, and that's the and there's a need to automate at least some, if not all, of these knobs, so that ultimately the value for a organization that's using AI is that we don't want to be taking weeks to take an application and adapt it to the data set or data requirements of a new customer or a new user. We want to be doing this in hours, uh, maybe even minutes if, if possible, right? At least in terms of human time. The computers can take all the time they want to, to crunch the numbers and figure out what the right tuning norms are, but the humans should not have to be doing this, right? So really the vision for, for this new generation of tune that we're working on is to automate even more of that universal pipeline so and just bring down the time to value for an organization that's trying to take AI from one data set to the next data set or for one client to the next client or for one user's custom data to another user's custom data. Because really the value of AI in a lot of um, business to business applications comes from taking an AI application and then customizing that or rather customizing it with the data that a specific client has, a specific end user has. All right. I said I can, a little bit about that, but does that give you a little picture of what automation really means in the context yeah, of yeah. Yes, it's coming together. And, and maybe I can add one uh, 
one point there around you know what you just said about it's not just the auto ML of hyperparameter optimization on a single model but you know the 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 next generation of auto ML is the uh, optimization of all parameters across all parts of a machine learning system um, that's by the way something that we're really interested in bringing into the Petium platform and it's definitely a core part of what universal pipelines is uh, uh, promises to users. Uh, how can you uh, not just compose using all of these castle technologies, not, not just visualize and, and look at and reconfigure the entire pipeline, but also optimize it in, in its entirety across however many models that are part of that pipeline. Um, and by the way, uh, one, one thing that you um, maybe didn't mention quite a, in, in quite as much detail is the amortized aspect of the auto-tuning as well. Right. You, the, this is maybe the beginning of meta learning. Indeed. Now that thanks for bringing that up. So that is another technology that's present inside uh, uh, Tune, and which we also hope to take to its successor versions that tune across the entire universal pipeline. Now, amortization here is this interesting concept that's really related to like uh, crowdsource. You, you can think of it as like. Uh, uh, you know, there's a whole series of projects called the at-home projects in which you uh, use the power of the crowd or use the power of a lot of machines to solve these hard scientific challenges. Now, amortized auto-tuning is a little like this in concept. The idea is that we can learn from similar AI programs with some similarities in their parameter structure, right? But they're not exactly identical. Maybe they use a different model. Maybe they use a different set. Maybe there's some structural changes in there. But there is a way, in fact, to learn from the tuning results where we're tuning these knobs, these hyperparameters. And then we got a great performance on AI application A. And now we go to AI application B. That's slightly different from A because the model is different or some of the data settings are different. But you know, there's some overlap between these two, right? It's not 100% different. How can we use the information we got from turning the knobs on A to more quickly find the knobs on application B? So that's what I meant by when I said like it's like an at-home project or it's like a crowdsourcing project. The ambition behind the amortized auto-tuning, uh, which is um, a really technical term, and that's why let's just call it crowdsourced tuning, right? I think I prefer that name. This idea of crowdsourced tuning is that if we could build a database, right, of all these applications, and maybe there's a public component to this database where people are submitting their uh, their results written in universal pipelines. And by the way, this is actually why a technology like universal pipelines is so important to enable the full value of crowdsource like tuning, because you need a standard way, a really standardized and, and modular and also portable way to specify a pipeline. But once you have that specification, right, then you could imagine this going to a database of tuning results where say that, hey, this is the set of knobs that work for this particular pipeline. And then when another user that has a similar but slightly different pipeline has a tune, the amortized auto-tuning code or this you know, crowdsource tuning can figure out you know, what's similar, what's different between these two pipelines, and then use that earlier result to jumpstart and increase the speed of how quickly it's gonna find the right value of those knobs. Like it can cut it down from say like a hundred trials down to maybe 20 or fewer trials just by having the right starting point. Uh, but it's not just a matter of starting point. It's really also learning about what is the mapping from one AI pipeline to another AI pipeline, right in my example. So right now this, this crowdsource tuning is implemented in tune for models to models. Like I'm going from uh, say a uh, one computer vision model to another computer vision model. But when this is combined with the broader vision of uh, tuning across the whole pipeline, then we're now talking about crowdsource tuning from pipeline to pipeline. And that's a totally new frontier that um, you know not many people are thinking about right now. But I believe personally that that's going to be a way to really help AI achieve that maturity in its stride where the, the, the barrier to entry in terms of the amount of expertise, but also in terms of about the amount of time you have to spend uh, managing and massaging this program to get it to work, right, is really decreased greatly. And that's, that's the power of this amortized auto-tuning or crowdsource tuning. Now, I've described that in a way that 
that you folks would understand. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, the, the future of AI too, um, but let's just quickly, maybe we could touch on some of the, like the two new kids on the block in the castle ecosystem because we're going to have their authors on the podcast uh, in the coming weeks so what what am i looking at right now this looks pretty cool we put this out on twitter and shared it with the community uh earlier today so what maybe just give us a you know the the quick pitch on what alpha is and uh you know what i guess opt is for people that aren't familiar with the model and then what is all this cool mm -hmm. stuff that i'm able to do on here and why was i not able to do it before Yes, so uh, here I'm going to do a shout out to uh, you know our colleague in the Castle organization, uh, Hao Zhang, who's really one of the uh, uh, the big brains behind this Alpha project, right? And so I understand that you know we'll have a future podcast with him. So I wanted to call it out for you know any viewers to tune in to Hao's podcast when that comes in a little bit. So now that I'm done plugging for Hao, what is Alpha? So Alpha is a technology that relates to the scale up I talked about earlier, the scale up of AI programs, right? It turns out that some of these models have been getting so large that you can't even do the API uh, serving or inference. This is where you actually put the model production and make it deliver results. You can't even do that on a single machine anymore, or at least not a machine that uh, most organizations would have commercial access to. Right, so Alpa is really uh, a piece of software that takes some of these massive models, such as um, here, we're talking about an open source model called OPT-175. This is a model that was released by uh, Meta, you know, nay Facebook, um, uh, fairly recently. And it was the answer to OpenAI's uh, GPT-3 model. It's fairly similar in size and probably fairly similar in architecture too. But uh, its, op its open source license allows for non-commercial use of it. So for example, a university like MBC AI could use the model to host a free service. Except the thing is, you need the software to actually do the inference. All, uh, all Meta provided was the model file itself, right? So how do you actually do that? Well, that's where Alpha comes in. So Alpha uses a technology called, um, called hybrid parallelism which allows it to take a machine learning uh, program and split its computation across multiple machines uh, in a way that uh, is extremely sophisticated to the level of how a, uh, if, if anyone here has experience with like programming languages like C++, right? The, the compilers for C++ do a lot of optimization under the hood of the program. Like, so the actual program you write in C++ language uh, may not look anything structurally like what the compiler produces at the end of the day. And that's because there's a lot of optimizations that can be performed. And this is hybrid parallelism is something similar where the internals of a program down to its individual mathematical computations are being planned and split across different GPUs, different worker machines, in a way so that the entire flow of the program, its performance is maximized, uh, and also the memory usage is split and balanced across multiple machines. So what does Alpha make possible that wasn't possible before? This OPT-175 model could only have run on a very specific uh, uh, single machine, which has eight of the latest GPUs by NVIDIA and is their maximum memory configuration. That is to say the 80 gigabyte A100 configuration. What does that I thing hear. cost? Say that again? What, what does that thing cost? Well, before we even talk about the cost, let me tell you that actually getting your hands on these machines is very difficult. Uh, and that's because there is a ongoing supply chain crunch right now. So even if you were able to pay for it, um, uh, whether you could actually order one and whether the lead time would, would allow you to actually get anything done. Uh, NVIDIA, of course, will happily sell it to you, but whether or not it'll be delivered this year, that's an open question. <laughs> so, so, uh, so the first thing I want to point out is that even if you were to try to get one of these 80 gigabyte GPUs, it's a bit hard to get them uh, because of the supply chain crisis. And then secondly, um, what do they actually cost? Well, um, prices are always indicative, but I've heard that these high-end machines with eight GPUs of the latest generation and highest grade model by NVIDIA will set you back somewhere between 200,000 to 300,000 USD per machine. 
Um, first of all, they are in short supply. So, you know, everybody can charge a premium from them. And secondly, uh, they are one of the few ways to run OPT-175 or similar models on a single machine. In fact, there's a model recently released by uh, Hugging Face uh, called Bloom, which is also around the same size as GPT-3 and OPT-175. They actually release code to allow you to set up a server for it, except you need uh, this very high-end setup to be able to pull it off, right? which uh, very few organizations have access to. What Alpa is doing is that by chaining together multiple lesser machines, maybe more reasonably priced, but you know, with less capacity in terms of the number of GPUs or the aggregate amount of GPU memory, you're actually able to run and serve one of these models. This thing here is running on four machines at MVZ UAI, each with four GPUs, each with 40 gigabyte of memory. So that's the same amount of memory as an eight times 80 gigabyte uh, setup, uh, which allows us to run it but we're able to do it in machines that only cost us 20,000 a piece. So that's $80,000 of hardware versus 200 to 400K. And then I'm able to play with it. So instead of just reading a cool paper from Facebook and seeing the model, I can actually you know, do something with it, which is very cool. So let's just do, if you could, I also see Betty uh, here. And I know uh, Betty's author is gonna be on the podcast as well in the coming weeks. So maybe you give us like the, the two minute um, preview of what we'll be talking about with Song and what, what Betty does. Right, so again, another shout out. Song is also a good friend of mine, like Hao Tang. And uh, he, uh, you know, he and I talked a lot uh, behind the scenes about getting Betty featured as one of the castle projects. So again, uh, he, I, I want to just you know send a shout out to Sang and for those of who are interested. So Betty, by the way, falls under Alpha falls under the scalable part of Castle, and Betty falls under the automatic part. It's like a counterpart to the Tune software. Uh, and and so if any of you here on the audience are interested in learning more about automatic and tuning software for for AI universal pipelines, right? Shout out to Sang's uh, upcoming podcast with Petrum. Okay, now that I'm done plugging again, uh, what is Betty? So um, Betty fills a, a, a parallel role uh, with the Tune project in that the Tune project is designed for uh, optimizing the most, uh, what I was calling black box in the good way, most black box code, right? In, in the sense that the code could be just about anything as long as there's a knob and the knob can be changed and experimented with, Tune is able to handle that type of code. Now, Betty, handles a, a class of uh, programs that's becoming uh, increasingly popular in some sectors of the AI com research community. And these are programs that chain together several pieces of model code or essentially optimization programs. A deep learning program is basically one giant optimization program. For these, uh, for, for AI pipelines in which there are several pieces of optimization code that's adjacent or side by side, you can do better than black box optimization. Uh, because it turns out that you can exploit the structure of these programs to do the tuning in a lot, uh, at least a lot faster, but also with, a, I think, a higher precision that you can also get to a better setting that a black box optimization program may not be able to pull off. So basically these, um, I guess the way I would say, the, the, the real world analogy I would give here is that you have different types of fuel. Like you have gasoline for regular cars and that gets your car moving from point A to point B use of aviation fuel, which is very specialized and can only be used for aircraft and its engines, right? So, so Tune is in a way um, kind of the, the gasoline and it's able to handle any type of uh, program, uh, whereas Betty is a bit specialized for uh, towards some of these uh, emerging uh, trends and technologies in AI, where many of these uh, deep learning models are being chained together into a whole. Uh, so basically it's it's meant for different uh, slightly different audiences uh, and the benefit is that if your program fits the structure that Betty uh, is able to handle, then you're able to do all of these functions uh, uh, that's listed here in the introduction, right? From hyperparameter tuning, but also this concept called neural architecture search in which you're morphing the deep learning models in order to um, in order to 
uh, find a better, perhaps more efficient on your computers, right? Or perhaps just more performant in terms of your task, right? And then a couple of other, you know, pieces of functionality that's all being rolled into one package. Uh, and I think that's one of the nice things about Castle is that there is overlap between some of these pieces of Castle software. And I think that's a necessity uh, due to the diversity of AI applications and programs that there is a need to combine different tools into the same project. And some of these tools may overlap with each other, like just like how I described, AdaptDL has these batch size and learning rate tuning knobs. That's also handled by Tune. And Tune also can handle what uh, Betty does, but Betty will do better on a subset of things that Tune does. This is all good and healthy for an ecosystem. But what I, and because we're getting to the end of the podcast, right? What I really want to emphasize is that none of that magic, none of that integration between different uh, tools that are, are partially overlapping or not overlapping, whatever combination that exists in our ecosystem is possible without this idea of universal pipelines. So I want to talk about a project that we are launching in hopefully uh, sometime later this year, but it's not up on the webpage called the PIR Lib project. We'll probably need to cover for a more catchy name for this one, but PIR Lib is what I was talking about earlier, Julian and Adil, about this taking the key part of the universal pipelines technology in the Fetchum platform and making that open source because that allows our Castle ecosystem users to start assembling, instead of using the Castle projects piecemeal, uh, uh, we can start assembling these together into a uh, pipeline. And then Petrum is probably the best place to run this universal pipeline. But the point is that you can take this universal pipeline, you can play around with it, you can experiment with it, you can take, you can test it out. Uh, and, and I'm sure others will develop tools around this idea of universal pipelines. Uh, but of course, at Petrum, we'll always strive to be the place that enterprises want to use to consume and manage these universal pipelines. So I hope that calls out a little bit about the future vision and direction we're taking the capsule project as we expand the ecosystem to include more and more projects that are overlapping or complementing with each other in certain ways. We need a way to tie all of this together and that's where universal pipelines and the PIR lay project come in. Very cool. And we have one minute left. I probably could talk to you for you know two more hours, but we didn't book you for that long. I just I wonder if you could just take a, a couple of minutes to tell us a little bit about uh, you know, your reference to the maturation of the AI landscape, because you're, you know, becoming quite the central figure to what the future of AI is going to look like, you know, not just MLOps. Um, wondering what your thoughts are and what your vision is for the future, where we're trending and you know, where we're gonna end up. Hmm. So there's a lot of ways uh, one could answer this question. Maybe I'll start with uh, what it looks like from the MLOps perspective, right? What does ML maturation look like in terms of uh, MLOps? I would say that um, maturation to me is about integration and making that integration seamless and reliable, fuss-free, trouble-free, uh, and as robust experience as, as possible here. Um, the reality is that the AI field uh, or AI as a whole uh, wouldn't be as innovative as it was today if there wasn't this panoply of researchers, of open source producers, all working you know, to, to, to realize their own vision of what AI would look like, right? And far be it from me to say that one vision is right or wrong, but one thing I do know is that from the user perspective, uh, to make use of these programs, they have to interoperate with each other, right? I touched upon this with Universal Pipelines and PRLib and how Universal Pipelines is a core value of the Petrum platform. Uh, getting different pieces of software infrastructure to play nice with each other and to play nice with your hardware infrastructure is tough work. It's actually a, most, uh, a big part of the engineering for, uh, for many companies that are starting their MLOps journey and finding that they're ending up building their in-house tools or, or perhaps uh, 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 picking up different MLOps products and finding they need to then stitch them together to accomplish all the tasks that they, they need to do, right? So at, at Petrum, right, we're really thinking about how MLOps products interoperate with each other and how we can make that as seamless as possible so that no matter what kind of AI application you're building, right, the experience that we want to mature towards here is one where you pick the tools that you need and they click together. Right, that's it. 
right? That that is the type of experience that we are trying to push towards, because there are always going to be different needs in different organizations, and those organizations are going to know best what their needs are and what the software is. That our role is to make all that software click together. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Sean. This was great. It's a fantastic intro to our Castle series. So everyone stay tuned in the coming weeks. We'll be getting in more depth into the various tools involved in the ecosystem. Yeah, thank right. you very much, Sean. That was, uh, that was great. And I love the ending that you're, you're seeing the future is actually composable, automated, and scalable, perhaps, right? Right. Yeah. You want to make it, uh, I guess, Clicking together is kind of alluding to composability and you're clicking together these composable, automated and scalable parts together. So that's a bit of, it's been my pleasure to give a podcast here on this session. And you know, I hope all of you have a great rest of the uh, afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you much. so much. Okay. Bye. Uh, hope to have you back soon as well. <laughs> <laughs>